We're beginning a new series instead of ending a series on Easter. It's the launch of a new series, and I'm calling the as today's sermon, don't stay here, get out. It seems to be the exact opposite message that the church typically has. Y'all come, you need to be here, enter the doors, sit down, be quiet, listen to the sermon. But we're going to be looking at the book of Acts and how the church actually functioned how the message of Easter burst everything that tried to restrict it, everything that tried to contain it, every way in which it was sit down, be quiet, find your place, and the church exploded. So I drew a little graphic that's kind of a take. That'll be our image for the next few weeks. I'm going to be gone. I hadn't planned on this, but I'm going to be gone in two weeks because my 50th high school reunion is happening a year and a half late. I graduated in 1971, do the math. And that was supposed to be last year, and then it was supposed to be in the fall, and then COVID hit. So now it's this coming week, two weeks away. So I'm going to my 50th high school reunion, and that is exciting and frightening at the same time. Because what are you supposed to do when you see people you haven't seen in 50 years that you didn't really like when you were in high school? (laughs) But I love them. I love, if anybody's watching, I love you all. We have a ton of people that watch from all over the country who watch our service with us. I made an odd comment to one of my friends who lives in Phoenix, and he pulled out a quote from a sermon like two or three weeks before. I said, where'd you get that image? He goes, you said that. Life is weird. So we're looking at a theme of get, don't stay here, burst the bonds, everything that shackles you, everything that ties you down or hems you in, find a way of getting released from that. The church actually seems to have gotten it backwards. Ever since in the Roman Empire, when the church became legal and then it became required, the church began building buildings with doors on them. I had a lady who came to our church uh, probably 15, 20 years ago. And she would be very spotty, very sporadic. And I ran into her in a store somewhere, and I just made the odd comment, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. And she goes, I came to your church, and it was like I was on the outside looking in. She went like this in the store. And I was trying to figure out what's going on in there. And that image really stuck with me. Is that what the church is? We've become a place that people peer in from the outside. What's going on in there? What are those people like? So as I began reading and studying and thinking through, just letting it mull in my mind, I found that the message of Scripture is actually the exact opposite. It's burst out of the doors. Take them down. Tear apart things that separate people from God and from each other and make life happen. That's really what the resurrection is all about. We're going to be looking at that today. Our passage, I saw a cartoon. uh, You might have seen it online. And it's Jesus at the Last Supper... And Jesus is quoted in the cartoon as saying, one of you is going to betray me, but four of you are getting book deals. And I laughed about that because on a surface, they're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only two of which were actually there. And only Peter actually wrote another book of the New Testament, Matthew and John, So there were four book deals, but only three of them got published. So then I laughed even harder because the person who came up with the joke didn't get the joke. It wasn't about the book deals. And typically on Easter, I saw another cartoon where a guy is standing at the door shaking hands with the pastor after the service is over, and he goes, you know, it's very interesting, but you really need to broaden out. Every time I come, I hear the same message over and over and over because he only comes on Easter. 
you have your same message. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have the four accounts of the resurrection of Jesus as the climax to the gospel. Mark is a few verses, really no emphasis at all. Matthew has a chapter, Luke has a chapter, John has two chapters. I'm not reading any of them today. We're reading Luke's sequel to the Gospel of Luke called the Book of Acts. And in that book, he starts where the Gospel of Luke... It's very, I think, quite interesting. In my former book, Theophilus... I wrote about everything that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. As they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. I find that description from Luke incredibly delightful and illuminating. Most holy books take their leaders and put them up on pedestals. They're like superlative at everything. They've got all the pithy statements. They're wise. They're intelligent. They're they're the top shelf people, but not the Bible. The guys who started this fellowship thing that we know as the church were idiots. I mean, they just really didn't get it. Even in real time, you would think after three years spending time with Jesus, seeing him walk on the water, turn water into wine, open blind eyes, raise people who have been been, uh, uh, disabled for their entire lifetimes, see him crucified, experienced 40 days of the resurrection, that somehow it would seep into their thick skulls what was going on, And what it meant, but they didn't. It's absolutely incredible. For the Luke is writing a report based on what he had gained from those who were early eyewitnesses. He probably wrote this 30 years after these events occurred. So the church has started to explode. It's kind of gone everywhere. They have the advantage of a little bit of time seeing what happened with the message and it was beginning to grow. But Luke takes time to research from eyewitnesses what actually happened. And as he writes this story, it is absolutely astounding because we tend to miss the details. We want to get to the part about being filled with the Holy Spirit and tongues of fire coming out of the sky and all this stuff. But that's not the way Luke says it actually happened. Jesus spent time in ordinary circumstances, even eating meals with them, And in verse 3, it says, 
After his suffering, he presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared for a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, if you go back into the Gospels, particularly Matthew chapter 13, but they're scattered all over, there are many parables that Jesus used. Parable is a picture story. It's an experience from life, kind of like an expanded metaphor that will tell you what it is point. The metaphor is not the point. The metaphor is not literal. It is a description of a truth. So if you read the parables of the kingdom of God, what he's talking about after his resurrection, he spoke to them not about his commands, not about the demands, not about the expectations, not about any of those things. He spoke about the kingdom of God. When he sent them out to go do ministry for the first time, he said to them, all I want you to do is say the kingdom of God is near. It's about the kingdom of God. So he spoke to them in this 40-day time period about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not what happens after final judgment where we get to spend eternity. The kingdom of God is the community of those who are following Christ. It's modeled It's damaged, it's human, it's very, very real. It has great good in it and it has terrible harm in it. It's real, it's the real human community. And he spoke to them about what was going to happen. If you read the book of Acts, you find it was not an easy journey where the pathway was all nice and smooth and, and they were in rose gardens all the time. Some extremely difficult things that happened. But those who listened to Jesus were ready for that. They knew it was going to be a tough haul to be able to work with human beings who were coming into a community of those who were believers. Not easy, not always nice, not usually pretty. So he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Then Luke is pretty careful about having researched this when the disciples are at the moment that he's about to leave, they ask one very pertinent question. Acts 1.6. They gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Israel's golden day under David and Solomon, they were the top country of the world. Their armies were powerful. They never lost a battle. Their cities were beautiful, impeccable. Their temple was glorious with marble and gold and purple cloth, and everybody came from around the world in awe and admiration of the power of David and the wisdom of Solomon. And then for the next thousand years Israel declined down further further to the bottom they were taken over by Rome they were under the boot of the Roman army they were an occupied nation the Romans could take and do anything they wanted to anyone in Israel and there's nothing they could do about it and so the disciples having seen this incredible miracle of God, a resurrection from the dead, and the one question they have is, are we getting our kingdom back? Do we get to sit at your left hand and right hand when you're the king? Are you going to make everything all right for us? It's very, very interesting. It's a fascinating question when he speaks to them about the kingdom of God and they bring up the kingdom of Israel. They just, they didn't get it. They're still waiting for, I want my own. I want to be one of the winners of the world. I want you to fix things so that I'm on top again. Can't you give our golden age back to us so we get to be the most important people on earth? And Jesus doesn't condemn them. He doesn't insult them. He simply sidetracks the issue. The Father knows those things, and that's not for you to know. I want you to wait. You're not going to stay here 
You're not gonna set up residence. This isn't your location. I want you to wait till you have what you need to be able to change the world. Power from on high. So what did Jesus actually then give them? In chapter 1, verse 8, context of this conversation, here's what the kingdom of God is. It's wheat and tares, weeds are mixed in. It's pure meal, but leavening has been added to it secretly. It is good seed that has been scattered and it will grow 30, 60, 100 fold, but birds come and snatch it and weeds choke it out. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny mustard seed and it grows so big vultures will build their nest in its branches. But I want you to wait until you have power from the Holy Spirit. I have a gift for you. I have something that the Father has promised and it's not riches and glory and world fame. It's not that you get to be the top country of the world and your golden age is not coming back. We're creating something entirely new. A living community. That's the nature of our church now. It's not to grow to be the biggest church, not to have fancy services, put in laser lights and smoke machines. It's to be a living community of people engaged in the journey of life together. And there, Jesus is alive in our midst. That only happens when the Holy Spirit is dynamically at work. And he uses the word power. It's not authority where they get to say what happens. It's the power to serve, to change the world, to change your own life, and to change the lives of others. And he said, I want you to wait until it comes. It was only 10 days. They did some other business during that 10-day period. But what's really, really interesting is they did finally what Jesus said. You have walked with me physically. Now I want to live with you spiritually. How did they respond to that final statement, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait. And power from on high is going to come. And you will be my witnesses. You will witness of me throughout Jerusalem and Judea, our region, and Samaria, our enemy region, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he ascended into heaven and they just stood there with their mouths open, staring into the sky. That is such an incredible picture. As opposed to just reading through it and, 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 and it dismissing that as an image, here is an event which occurred once in human history. Jesus ascending into heaven, and these guys are just in shock. Staring off into space having no idea what to do next, just standing there. That is such an incredible picture to me of the reality of who these disciples were. They actually didn't get it. So God sent these two messengers in gleaming white clothes. They didn't even know where they came from. And the scripture doesn't say where they came from. Were they angels? Did they pop in? Were they apparate? Nobody, it doesn't even say, not important. And these two men in gleaming white asked the collection of disciples who are standing there with their mouths open, staring off in the sky, and they ask the most obvious question. Why are you staring into the sky? Uh, duh. Jesus just left. And we have no idea what's going to happen next. And they said... He told you what to do. Go to Jerusalem and wait. And when you are filled with power, you'll have something to say. The reality is, in this message, the real nature of Easter is not just an empty tomb. It's all four locations. The inn where he was born, there wasn't room, so he was born a stable underneath. 
all of his ministry led to the cross where he died as an executed criminal in full public view of the people of Israel. And the empty tomb was in that same place and no one was there waiting until after the tomb was empty. And they came and looked and examined and questioned and peeked inside. And then Jesus began to meet with them and convince them. This is not some story. It's not a hallucination. We're not talking ghosts here. This is real resurrection. And then the sky. And the sky is where he went in, but it's also where the spirit came out. And so the issue is not just merely what happened on Easter Sunday or what happens on Good Friday or what happens at Christmas or what happens at Pentecost. It's all of it. And the message of resurrection is about that power of life that he can give a child to a couple by his power. He can stand by his son who is dying for the sin of the world and receive that sacrifice as adequate payment. He can raise a dead body to life in the midst of a sealed tomb and he can return to inhabit his people to give them power from on high. So the reality of Easter is not merely a simple message that happened 2,000 years ago. It happens today. It happens right here. And the issue is not come in and be safe. It is get out of here because God is about to explode. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Easter Sunday is an event for us. It's a celebration. It's about clothes and family and meals and Easter eggs and the bunny and all that stuff. Part of the fun. It's about springtime and new life and all that kind of uh, fertility stuff. But the real message of resurrection is all of life, birth, death, power, overcoming, being locked in and shut down and closed away. And your power breaks every shackle. There is nothing that can bind us because of Easter. So explode us. In Jesus' name we pray.